Greetings shippers, welcome back. And today we get to talk about Star Trek, one of my favorite things to do. And we're gonna take a look at a pairing that's having a little bit of a revival because of a shift in how media is consumed. This ship has been requested for a while, so I'm very excited to be finally getting to it. You guys know how slow I can be. I get there, I swear. Tortoise wins the race. Also, the return of the Quarks t-shirt because never has it been more appropriate. But back to the ship. This ship has undergone many shifts in perception over the years, down to its very name. It's it's the pairing of Garrick and Bashir from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. As they came to prominence in the early 90s, the ship was known as G slash B. However, over time, it has morphed to Garishir. More in keeping with the current trend of combining names or creating elaborate ship names based on themes. As one can imagine, with a pairing of this magnitude, there is a lot to talk about. So, let's get started. Star Trek Deep Space Nine, known often simply as DS9, aired originally from 1993 to 1999, and consisted of seven seasons and 100 76 episodes. It was a spin-off of the extremely successful Star Trek revival series, Star Trek The Next Generation, or TNG. From the start, DS9 had a very different tone and focus than the other series within the franchise, and even with recent newer additions, continues to stand apart. The more episodic format remained in place, but it was balanced with heightened continuity that transformed into serialized arcs by the series' conclusion. The series also focused much more heavily on political intrigue, religious themes, and its alien characters, as well as its human ones, more so than any of the other series. The characters also underwent significant growth throughout the series, as was the case with the two participants in this ship. Indeed, their relationship undergoes several shifts as the series goes on, making it a rather layered and rewarding pairing for those who enjoy it. DS9, of course, is not for everyone, but it did and does still have a tendency to be overlooked at times when it comes to the Trek pantheon. So with all of that stated, let's start off by meeting the players. First up, Dr. Julian Bashir. Starting off the series as an exuberant brash flirt, the Doctor was extremely unpopular for the first couple of seasons, at the very least the first one, as some found his keen attitude and constant attempts to ingratiate himself and be liked grating. In a rare case of course correction, his personality was altered through an in-text character growth that allowed the irritation viewers felt with him to be mirrored by the characters on the show, allowing him to develop one of the more complex character arcs as he matured and became genuinely more well-liked by the crew and the audience alike. This was accomplished by having him grow from his mistakes and the revelation that he himself was more complex than it first appeared. He is a dedicated Starfleet officer and an excellent doctor, with a genuine passion and belief in his oath, which led some to take to him right away. His arc just becoming an added bonus. Guarding secrets of his own, Dr. Bashir is actually deeply insecure and comes into his own throughout the series, and his naivety is slowly stripped away by the war, in some cases in horrifyingly ironic ways. By series end, he is more jaded, yet still hopeful and much more well-rounded, with some close, dear friends, of whom Garrick is one. Elam Garrick is a Cardassian tailor living aboard Deep Space Nine in truly awkward circumstances. Exiled by his people and forced to live largely amongst the race they had conquered, abused and suppressed, Garrick keeps most of his true feelings hidden and is enigmatic and difficult to read. There is also an air of danger about him and he can and has been quite cruel in the past and the present. A former spy, he is also given to fits of manipulation and has many friends in low places, or rather acquaintances. He also suffers from depression and has been driven to desperation by his circumstances in the past. Despite all of this, there is a part of him that longs for acceptance and friendship and throughout the course of the series, he seems to perhaps achieve it. His past is layered and complex and it is difficult to see if even he knows the truth about any more, or if he does, if he is willing to tell anyone. Despite this, he is fiercely loyal to his people and bold enough to go after what he is interested in. One of those things seemingly being Dr. Bashir. Dr. Bashir and Garrick meet in season one, episode three, past prologue, in an encounter that very much sets the tone for their relationship. Good day to you, Doctor. I'm so glad to have made such an interesting new friend today. From the outset, Andrew Robinson played his role with a flirtatious edge, approaching Bashir at least partially out of an intense physical attraction, with Robinson stating, I started out playing Garrick as someone who doesn't have a defined sexuality. He's not gay, he's not straight, it's a non-issue for him. Basically, his sexuality is inclusive. But it's Star Trek, and there were a couple of things working against that. One is that Americans really are very nervous about sexual ambiguity. Also, this is a family show. They have to keep it on the straight and narrow. So then I backed off from it. Originally, in the 
very first episode, I loved the man's absolute fearlessness about presenting himself to an attractive human being. The fact that the attractive human being is a man, Bashir, doesn't make any difference to him. But that was a little too sophisticated, I think. This decision was potentially initially emboldened by the fact that Garrick was supposed to be a one-shot character. However, he proved so popular he became one of the core recurring cast. However, this flirtatious tone remained for the majority of their interactions, especially the early ones. For the first couple of seasons, Garrick and Bashir's friendship was in stark focus. Commencing as slightly inscrutable, potentially Garrick initiating out of attraction and boredom and nothing to lose, and Bashir reciprocating out of curiosity and some degree of excitement and exclusivity due to getting so close to such a mysterious figure, the relationship quickly ballooned into a real friendship. The two regularly ate lunch together, exchanged cultural material such as literature, the two also have a couple of standalone episodes, either going on adventures together or the powerhouse episode The Wire, wherein Bashir helps Garrick go through withdrawal. On top of that, the two engaged in near-constant banter that many read as flirtation, in large part because of how both actors played their scenes, together purposely inserting suggestive undertones. As a result, shippers were quick to notice, and the ship gained a quick and steadfast following, and then things really got interesting canon-wise, though not in the most positive way in the minds of many fans. From late season 3 onwards, there is a precipitous drop in the amount of Garrick Bashir interactions, and solo episodes become a rarity. Suddenly, there was a new friendship arc for Bashir, one that had been present before, but was abruptly pushed to the foreground, that being his quest to befriend Chief O'Brien. And Garrick was given his own arcs that had more to do with his own backstory, independent of Bashir, and later on for a brief period of time was given a female love interest. Although there is a good argument that that was somewhat one-sided. Shippers were suddenly left to fill a gap left by a canon that seemed determined to convince audiences that this intense dynamic friendship had suddenly cooled. Though when the two interacted, that flirtatious edge was still there, albeit slightly more subtle at times. On top of the aforementioned quote, Robinson is said to have attributed this to a lack of writer support, leaving him to input the subtext himself. However, it is also said that at least one writer was initially purposely writing Garrick as attracted to Bashir. However, it is also said that the dwindling of on-screen interactions was deliberate, a decree by a frightened network that was not ready to pursue such a relationship on screen, instead preferring to address the issue obliquely in the standard one-off episode format, rather than allow something to develop that would potentially be front and center. Whatever happened, it did not stop shippers. The fandom became filled with missing scenes authors, filling in how the two would react to canonical events. Some sought to reignite the friendship via fixits, while others were convinced that just because it wasn't on screen didn't mean it wasn't happening. In short, in their minds, it hadn't cooled at all. In a way, this lack of interaction simply drove the fans who did ship it to be much more creative. Still, by the series' end, the two barely interacted, and the very heartfelt end to their journey was actually cut from the television airing of the finale, allegedly for time, though it was later reinserted. And in all fairness, it is a long finale. And when shows were broadcast on network television, it was necessary to leave the allotted space for ads. So it was a regular occurrence for specials or movies that were extra long to end up being cut, with edited versions being released on television to leave space for these commercials. Through it all, shippers remained loyal. So aside from all the on-screen moments, why were these two shipped? Well, for one thing, their character traits matched well, and the minds of many only came more into alignment as the series progressed. A process that was further crystallized as due to the lack of on-screen interaction, it was left to the minds of fans and shippers to see how these two would actually engage with the newfound changes to their characters. Indeed, despite less on-screen appearances, some shippers shipped these two more as the series went on, the exact opposite effect of what the network seemed to intend. Bashir, initially enamored by the mere concept of Garrick, and his romanticized version of his spy past becomes more mature as the series goes on, guided in part by Garrick as well as circumstance. He has his own sharp edges, just as Garrick actually has a soft your side. The two are both cunning and both good at hiding the truth about themselves. Some feel this would lead them to find a safe space with each other, to be as close to themselves as possible. Both are outsiders longing for acceptance, and some shippers feel acceptance could be found in the other. Both are also not judgmental of the other, and ready to tolerate each other's flaws. The two have also been shown to grow together seemingly in the same direction. And it is possible that they could reveal portions of themselves to each other that they haven't to anybody else. While they start out as seemingly opposites, they are revealed to be more alike than the other other ever anticipated. Yes, I am trying to slightly avoid spoilers for a series that is over 20 years old, more on why later. And of course, because of the intensity of their interactions, some anticipate some very smutty encounters, with an added intriguing edge of exploring alien physiology and other classic both sci-fi and Trek tropes. The pairing was also driven by the clear chemistry present, even outside of explicit flirtation, in part present due to the strong friendship actors Sadig and Robinson struck up on set, and continue to this day. Robinson also wrote a novel following up with Garrick Post series that portrayed the character more in line with how he perceived him, including in terms of his sexuality. Now, of course, not everyone shipped them, and here are some reasons as to why. Some were never enamored of the friendship and readily accepted their lack of on-screen interaction
action as representative of a drifting in their relationship, and some never believed it was actually that close to begin with. Indeed, it was riddled with lies and hurt that many felt would not be conducive to a relationship, or at least not a healthy one. That's right! And left me to live out my days with nothing to look forward to but having lunch with you. I'm sorry you feel that way. Some never grew to like Bashir despite the writer's best efforts. Others felt that while an attraction may be present, it was clearly one-sided, with Garrick wanting Bashir, but it being much more unclear whether Bashir was actually interested or merely intrigued by Garrick's mystique, or even worse, leading him on. Others felt it would be a dark, unhealthy relationship, and while some shippers were on board with that iteration, others felt that it would be unpleasant, and hence stayed away. Garrick taking advantage of a naive Bashir, feeding into his obvious spy fantasies and desire to be useful and important, while others felt that given what was revealed about Bashir later on, the manipulation could perhaps be the other way around. Others felt that the cultural differences, both physical and ideological, would be too large to circumvent. And for some, it was simply too complicated. There was too much going on, too many shifts, making it a difficult pairing to follow or get behind. Instead of seeing all of the moments as jumping on points, they became obstacles. And of course, there were also other shifts. For Bashir in particular, such as between him and Jatsia Dax, as well as other later canon pairings that some fans genuinely enjoyed and preferred, though of course as always multi-shipping is ever possible. On top of this, there was a small contingent who did not see the chemistry or flirting, either out of a deeply ingrained heteronormativity, particularly during the time period when the series initially aired, or in some cases they are charged by other fans of willful ignorance. While Garishir was a popular and rather large ship, at least in terms of notoriety, there do not appear to be many works online, nothing in comparison to Kirk and Spock. This is of course a relative comparison, as Garrick and Bashir do have many more works than some other pairings within the Trek pantheon, and just some other fandoms in general. So why is that? Well, as this is an older pairing, at least in terms of the online age and the main avenues by which fandom is now consumed, many Garishir fics were lost, either time, purges, and in general the flow of fics slowed, leaving dedicated fans to keep their ship alive. However, as of late, from the 2010s onward, there has been a bit of a resurgence and a shift in the discourse surrounding this pairing. While Star Trek has long been a generational fandom, DS9 has not been the most popular of the Treks, with many dismissing it as inferior because it did not follow the traditional exploratory format, and as a result, the ships weren't passed down the same way that others were. On top of that, others were put off by the DS9 Babylon 5 controversy, though that is a tale for another day. Those who did enjoy the series and its ships and fandoms shared their love, but DVDs and box sets were not only expensive, but not as prolific as other Trek series. However, all of that changed with the onset of streaming services such as Netflix, which opened up not only DS9, but all Trek to a new, young, and varied audience. Well, almost all Trek. Suddenly, the series was accessible and people began to engage, either again or for the very first time. Garrick and Bashir instantly came to new shippers' attention, and fans began to produce new works and partake in newer fan activities, such as actively making gift sets, bite-sized moments that are easily shared and spread awareness of this ship even more, on top of new consolidated archives and various social media to help share the pair as well. As initially, when people were writing and creating works for this ship, it was pre this consolidated era, and yet it was also at the time when works would would be shared online, so there is not as much zine content out there as, say, some of the earlier pairings. However, with this new dissemination of Trek and this ship, the lament that it never became canon has grown, with many disappointed that such an obvious and rich opportunity was not allowed to be explored. Indeed, it was even rumored that at the time, Alexander Siddig and Robinson were told not to speculate about their character's relationship at cons. However, of late, that seems to have changed. Still, while it can be deemed a missed opportunity, each character was given a significant arc that was profound and interesting and fandom has and still continues to enrich the text by creating intricate scenarios of what might have been. And as always, things are a product of their time and the climate in which they originate. Trek has recently broken through its reticence to have canonical queer relationships of late. The irony that it took so long not lost on shippers, as Trek is essentially the birthplace of modern slash fiction. However, as the pairing is taking place on Star Trek Discovery, which is actually harder to access for most people than DS9, it's perhaps not having the widespread impact it could have had had CBS loosened the broad broadcasting reigns ever so slightly. As a result, for many more casual Trek fans, or just those not currently able to access Discovery, Garishir remains not only more self-evident, but more promising. And some who dislike Discovery still prefer the potential of these two, though many are embracing what Discovery has to offer. As for G slash B, thanks to the change in media transmission, the ship is not only still alive, but doing well, becoming more popular and more recognized. Proof positive that you never know what will happen with fandom, and even ships or fandoms that may seem to have had their day can rally and 
have a second, third, or even fourth coming. Who knows, maybe more. As some are going through for the first time and DS9 is not as well known, some viewers are unaware of the course events will take. As a result, there are even some what if fix being produced, worth speculating on the future that often vanish entirely upon a work's canonical completion. All in all, Garishir is a unique ship with many jumping on points and characters who go through a wealth of development, which means the ship changes over time and can be presented a variety of different ways. Indeed, the works tend to change in time the further one progresses in the series. If one is intrigued, it's a great time to get into the fandom, and the source material is fairly easy to access, although this does depend upon where you are. In certain locations, it is still difficult to access any trek, or it is far behind. So region also plays a large part in accessibility. Still, it seems to appear that more people have indeed gained access, and there is a breadth of work spanning years, with more being produced. This includes tie-in material. Indeed, the recent Enigma Tales novel is quite tragic for these two, so check that out if you're interested. Are you guys Garrick and Bashir shippers? What are your favorite moments between these two if you are? And how do you feel about Star Trek Deep Space Nine? I need to know. Tell me everything down below. I love Star Trek so much. I wish we talked about it more, but I don't want to spam you guys too much because my love is intense. If I could, I would just review nothing but Star Trek tie-in novels. I have a box. It's a problem. Speaking of, sideline to the side note, we're going to talk about Discovery, just in general. Some of the toxicity, the fandom, just all the things, because Discovery, it's almost like it's several different animals. It's the show, it's the media surrounding the show, it's fan response, it's accessibility, it's just, it's a lot of a lot. But I do have to say, I mean, if you can watch Enterprise, you can watch Discovery. I can't guarantee that you won't cringe or like it or make any guarantees at all, really. But honestly, if you can watch Enterprise, you can watch Discovery. There's a lot of shade against both those things in that statement. So much shade. Trek can't live in the shade. I don't know. I mean, I love all Trek. There's just a part of me that will like anything if it's Trek. It's a bit of a problem, I know. I have standards, though. Still have standards. Work level standards. That is not an endorsement. Okay, it's time to just wrap this up. Thanks so much for watching. There are many more ship videos coming up. Follow me on social media to keep track with what is coming up soon, and we'll be back to shipping very soon. So please stay tuned and let's get to that outro. See you guys soon. This has been Shippers Guides of the Galaxy. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if you need a shippable moments for these two because there are definitely enough moments for that. Special thanks to all of my patrons' names on the side. And as always, stay tuned for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.